The Lifestylist, episode 144. I'm Luke Story, a former celebrity fashion stylist and founder of School of Style. For the past 20 years, I've been relentlessly dedicated to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of health and spirituality. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Let's take a moment to give some love to our sponsor today, Athletic Greens, without whom this very episode would have been impossible. Now, Athletic Greens makes a fantastic superfood powder. It's a green powder. It's got over 75 ingredients. So what makes it awesome and different is that it essentially replaces tons of pills and powders and other stuff that you'd have to take. So if you're someone that wants to keep it simple, you want to get that nutrition in on the go, make it quick, make it powerful, Athletic Greens is the answer. It's what I do just about every damn morning. It's got over 25 alkaline, nutrient-dense raw superfoods. It's got natural extracts, herbs, and antioxidants. And what makes it really unique is it has five digestive enzymes and a super mushroom complex along with non-dairy probiotics. So that last bit there makes it really easy to assimilate and digest because there's no point in taking nutrition into your body if your body can't use it. And that's one of the most powerful things about Athletic Greens is your ability to actually take advantage of it. So if you want to check it out, go over to athleticgreens.com forward slash Luke and you will receive over $99 worth of free product on your first order. So go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Luke. Stay gold, pony boy, stay gold. If you recognize that quote, you're over 40. And that's okay, because guess what? I've got a product for you that's going to help give you energy. It's called Organifi Gold. And Organifi Gold is used to soothe and recover. So this is something you can take any time of the day, but I really like it at night, like in a warm elixir. You can make kind of a golden latte with coconut oil or ghee or whatever your fat of choice is. Now, the core ingredient of Organifi Gold is turmeric, which is an anti-inflammatory spice. And it's one of my favorite substances on earth. There's over 8,000 published studies and articles showing its numerous health benefits. So they combine turmeric with coconut milk, cinnamon, ginger, lemon balm, and two super mushrooms to make this really relaxing, warm beverage. So it reduces stress and it actually really helps you sleep. It just calms you down at night. So the Organifi Gold is truly gold. It's a home run. It's awesome. And I love it. And I take it. I don't want to, I can't lie. I can't say I take it every day because some nights I forget. I'm better at doing my drinks in the morning. But uh, when I do take it, I'm a happy man. So if you want to check out Organifi Gold or any of their other outstanding products, it's super easy. Here's the website, Organifi.com forward slash Luke. And Organifi is spelled with an I at the end. That's Organifi.com forward slash Luke. So that's good news, right? Oh, it gets even better. You know why? Because I've got a discount code for you. The discount code is Lifestylist, and that saves you 20%. It's a fat discount, yo. So go to Organifi.com, enter the code Lifestylist, and save 20%. Welcome one and welcome all to a unique and special episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Luke Story, but I'm also the guest in this particular Friday bootleg broadcast episode. Before we jump into that, though, I want to make sure to give a shout out to next Tuesday's show featuring Chris Keen, where we talk about 40 years of Zen and the power of neurofeedback. To make sure that you don't miss that show or any show to follow, just subscribe to this bad boy. All right, so here we are. This is an interview I did a few months back as a guest on my friend Fern Olivia's show, Sensual Intelligence on Focus TV. And also, just as a shout out to Fern, in addition to hosting her own show, Fern is also an international teacher and speaker on the power of integrative medicine, yoga, 
and intuitive self-healing. So make sure to look her up too. Her show is also awesome. Uh, my episode hopefully not being an exception. So she really has a knack for helping people go deep and get honest about their inner lives. And she definitely was able to accomplish that with yours truly. And after she released the video, which you can easily find online, by the way, I was actually so moved by the conversation I had with Fern that I eventually decided to break down and just put it out as a bonus episode, which is what you're about to hear. And if nothing else, just as an exercise in being courageous, raw, and real myself, and also in hopes that I might inspire a few of you to do the same in your own life and in your relationships. So I get pretty vulnerable in the interview about my experiences with relationships and those that have shaped me and made me who I am today, and the long journey that I'm still on toward forming a healthy relationship with myself and really evolving into my divine masculine, which is not a term that I usually use, but she used it and I'm just going to roll with it. I think it's kind of fitting. So my own romantic, sensual, sexual awakening is not something I usually talk about publicly. So I'm really excited to share this intimate conversation with you as terrifying as it might be. So as I record this intro... I'm now over a year into my most recent area of intense personal renovation. And I thought I better just put this out before I change my mind. (laughs) So I've already grown, you know, so much since I did this with her many months ago. And it's really rewarding to listen back to it, to take my notes and to see that I've actually made a lot of progress. And I'm in a much different place than I was even uh, at the time of this conversation. So here's an overview of the topics covered in this chat with Fern. Opening your soul to the next level of intimacy. Teachers and mentors appearing right when you're ready. Creating space within your relationship to yourself in order to add someone else to it when you're ready. The definition of sensual intelligence. Meditation as it pertains to sex and love. How I have overcome the pain, trauma, and loss in my own life learning from relationships rather than regretting them, losing your fear of being totally vulnerable, taking time off social media in order to get present to reality, how to build a truly deep relationship with yourself, the power of kundalini yoga in opening your heart, and then finally, finding a spiritual romantic relationship with your highest self as your guide. So if you're looking to fully accept yourself and get real and get honest, this conversation might just be the ignition you've been searching for. So enjoy the ride. I'm Fern Olivia, the host of Central Intelligence TV. We are filming here today at the Focus TV studios in West Hollywood. Today I have my dear friend Luke Story here with me today. Luke is the founder of the School of Style and the Life Stylist podcast. So excited to have him here. Amazing soul. Luke, tell me how you got here and welcome, by the way. So excited. How did you find your spiritual awakening and, and come to the place that you are in today? Well, I moved to Hollywood when I was 19 and uh, proceeded to want to, I wanted to become a musician, you know, and in the late 90s, or no, no, I'm sorry, late 80s, it went into the early uh, 90s, but uh, in the late 80s, you know, Hollywood was a pretty seedy place, so while I was pursuing music, I kind of got really caught up in the underbelly of Hollywood and got really involved in drugs and alcohol, and by the end of two, let me see, when was that, 1996, I was just a complete wreck of a human being and uh, made the decision that it was time to change my ways and turn my life around. And so at that point, I began this journey of getting into cleansing and fasting and health and wellness and meditation and going to India and learning about different ways that I could sort of not only stay sober, but just really improve my life and um, my physical, mental and spiritual well-being. And so that's the path I've been on now for got 21 years. Wow. Wow. So you kicked addiction, you kicked habits that ultimately brought you back to your true self and brought you into a very sensual place in your life. I mean, we were talking the other day at Soho House around sensuality and the work that you're doing, the men's work that you're doing and tapping into intimacy. How did you find that from being so far disconnected? Well, it's, you know, it's all part of the awakening journey, you know, so in the beginning, it was just 
about the act of staying physically abstinent from drugs and alcohol, you know, and then once you sort of unpeel that layer of dysfunction, then you find what's next. So the next was like, wow, I'm full of anxiety. That's why I did drugs or depression or whatever it was. And, you know, going into therapy and dealing with childhood trauma and different patterns and things like that, which eventually led me to all different forms of uh, meditation and whatnot. But in terms of the intimacy piece and stuff we were talking about the other day, that sort of like, it just happens to be the phase that I'm in right now of self-discovery and development where I realize, wow, I've been successful in business and I have my podcast, the Lifestyles podcast, and I'm building a great brand with that and, and building great relationships in the industry. But in my own personal life, there's been a disconnect, I think, in terms of romantic relationships and really having the ability to be... 100% present and seen and committed mm -hmm. and having a desire to have something deeper and more intimate. And so just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had a guy on my show, John Wineland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you, it's a great thing about having a podcast, you have guests and then sometimes they offer you a ticket to one of their events or something like that. Or if they sell a product in the health field, they'll send you their product or something. So John invited me to his workshop and it was just, it was a really profound uh, experience. In fact, the show I did with him came out today. And I was kind of reflecting on that, like, wow, I just met one person and he was like the catalyst for this whole other area of personal development and awakening that I guess I was ready for right now. It's amazing what when you declare that you're ready for something and your soul just knows that you're ready for that next step, the teacher appears, the mentor appears, the experience appears. You just have to be open and willing to accept the challenge. Yeah, that's so true because it's like if you would have 10 years ago thrown me in that particular workshop, for example, I, I like very well may have just left and be like, hey, thank you very much. This isn't for me because it was so it was terrifying on so many levels, you know, and there were things that I did years ago that were really difficult. But I, I find that when I'm in those situations that I'm always kind of at the brink of being ready for it. Mm -hmm. It's like right at my breaking point of comfort where I can somehow summage the, the courage and determination to handle that particular teaching or experience at that time. But I wouldn't have been able to handle it any sooner. So you're right. It comes like right at the right, right when time. you're ready. Yeah. Are there any rituals or practices from that training that you've taken away and incorporated into your daily life? I'm doing probably five of them right five now. Five of them. Can you tell us about a couple? <laughs> yeah, sure. So a lot of what that workshop was about was the embodiment uh, of either feminine in the case of the ladies present at the workshop or masculine energy and learning how to cultivate that so being a man and wanting to learn how to <clears throat> excuse me learn how to harness and control my masculine energy and kind of be um, someone that can hold space for the feminine so to speak uh, one of the things that we learned had a lot to do with breath and so I do a lot of breath work and you know you mm -hmm. do community yoga like me so I'm familiar with breath and I always thought yeah I'm a good breather like I've got the breath thing down but the way that we were taught to breathe in that to breathe in that workshop was like breathing sort of in a wave going down mm -hmm. starting in your lower belly and then sort of when you exhale going to lower belly mid chest and then more in your throat or solar plexus right so it's kind of like this wave so as i sit here with you in order for me to kind of hold my space and also just to concentrate and be focused I'm breathing in that way while you're talking. So if mm -hmm. I stop talking and then you talk to me for a second, then I'll be doing it. I'll be like, and also just holding my spine really straight. Um, so I'm like relaxed and rigid kind of at the same time. And then also just my body language and posture. So my feet aren't splayed out and all weird mm -hmm. and crooked. I can't face you directly because of the cameras and stuff. But if we were having a real conversation, <laughs> I'd be totally facing you. I would resist the urge to cross my arms or put my hands in my pockets or do any sort of intimacy deflection. So I'm mm -hmm. sitting here and my whole heart, throat chakra, all that stuff is very open eye contact. I'm, even if I feel a little insecure, nervous for a minute, I just use that sort of self-discipline to keep connected to you. So it's in the breath and the body and the body language that I'm able to sit here and hold space. And ever since that workshop, I've done it in every conversation that I've had. Wow. But that's just something, I, I think when I started working on myself, I figured out early on that reading something in a book or listening to a speaker or whatever, or watching a documentary about something, it doesn't do anything unless you apply it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first spiritual principles I learned is the, the principle of application. And the way it was described to me is like, yeah, imagine if you give a woman some makeup 
to go, you know, she wants to go out, so you hand her some lipstick, and the lipstick just sits on the table. It doesn't do anything for her unless she applies it. And mm -hmm. I don't know, for some reason, that analogy stuck, maybe because I used to work in fashion. I was like, oh, I get that. Like, you have to wear something. You got to own it. You have to put it on in order for it to have the benefit. Otherwise, it's just head knowledge, and it's just some intellectual, you know, mind game or something the ego will feed on because, oh, now I know something. Oh, yeah, breathing? Yeah, I know all about breathing. That doesn't mean shit unless I actually do it. Mm -hmm. And then I do it, and I get the the results, and then it just becomes part of how I live my day to day life, or how I hold myself. So in this case, how I hold my body and hold my breath, and hold someone's gaze, and really give someone my full attention. So um, it was about that workshop, for example, was about sexual and spiritual intimacy. Obviously, we're not having sex here; it's not that kind of a video, <laughs> <laughs> but. We are having a certain degree of intimacy because we want to provide value to what's being filmed and we want authenticity and we want mm -hmm. real connection, you know, so it's a different type of intimacy, but it's still intimacy. And it's huge. And it was so powerful. Even before we started filming this, I had some bloopers and you were sitting there breathing and I felt that and it was so calming. You, just this divine masculine sitting there breathing, holding space as I'm in the feminine, flowy, laughy, like silly place. I just felt this calming, grounding energy. And that's remarkable, and it's so profound. That's cool that, that you noticed that. Oh, yeah, you were just gazing was, at me breathing. You know what else I was doing? <laughs> I was sort of telepathically speaking to you. I mean, really, this is the kind of shit I do. Yes. I'm, I'm wacky. I was I was telling you, like, you got this. It's cool. Oh, I felt it. You got this. You're good. It's, it's all good, you know? Because I know how it is to sit in your position and have to be the one who's kind of on. And mm -hmm. I do my podcast. I'm sort of the one leading that whole conversation and making sure I hit certain cues and, you know, talk about my advertiser or whatever it is. So it's like I have empathy for what you're experiencing, trying to hold down a format. Mm. And so I was sort of telepathically sending that message to you. Um, but at the same time, yeah, just being aware that it's okay. Like we don't, we have plenty of time. It doesn't matter. In other words, like I'm seeing my anxiety I could potentially have anxiety for you having anxiety because you've done a bunch of interviews today and you know, you're fumbling on a couple words, but I see my own anxiety and I sort of breathe through that, mm. dissipate my own anxiety and then create space for your anxiety, hopefully to be dissipated too. And then lo and behold, we did it again and you're just like, cool, I'm just going to stop worrying about it and you just <laughs> ad-libbed it and everything worked out. You know? Yeah, we're here. We're still here. Yeah, but it's and, cool that you caught on to that. Yeah, too. I, I felt it and that I feel like is the cornerstone of sensuality, right? It's holding that shared space with someone and feeling okay and feeling alive and feeling, you know, like that, the way that you were breathing was like touch for me. It was so calming and reassuring. And I would love to know what does sensuality mean for you? Well, you just contextualize it in an interesting way, because I think on the surface level or what some people would probably have come to mind is like sexuality and sensuality right. sort of go together. Like, ooh, it's sensual. Like it has some sort of risque kind of you know, uh, almost like a sense of taboo, ooh, sensuality, but really mm -hmm. the way I look at it, and especially the way you just framed it, is more being in the present moment in your body and being aware of your senses. Mm -hmm. So as my hands sit on my lap, I'm aware of the sensation of how my jeans feel on the palms of my hands, and I'm aware of how my rings click together and could be picked up by the microphone. And so I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm mic'd right now. So there's a certain sensuality in an auditory sense because mm -hmm. I'm very aware of the traffic outside. I'm aware of my rings banging together. I'm aware of the tone of my voice, the resonance of my voice. And so there's sensuality on a lot of different levels. And it also could be touch. You know, um, what's that word? Kinesi, kin Kinesiology? Kinesi kin kin kinesthetic. Kinesthetic yeah. sensuality <laughs> where, yeah, so I feel myself, but I could be engaged with a partner or something like that and be embraced in a hug or a kiss or lovemaking or whatever it might be. And there's a deeper level of sensuality that's shared, but there's also a sensuality within oneself and it's just being rooted and grounded in one's mm -hmm. breath and eye contact and all the things we've been talking about. So... I would probably define it as just being present in my body and then whatever senses happen to be uh, going on in that particular moment based on the scenario are experienced on the same level, which could be eating chocolate. You know, eating mm -hmm. chocolate is very central or smelling a rose or something like that. It sort of depends on which sense perception organ you're using at any given moment. 
So I like that. I love that. And sensual intelligence is a word that I've, or a phrase that I've created to really explain that kind of like emotional uh, intelligence or that, that IQ. How would one increase their sensual intelligence if they feel like they don't notice things or they feel lost in their body or emotionally depleted? Are there ways that you could think of to help someone to find their way back? I think the first step would be learning some kind of meditation because mm -hmm. it's a meditation that that is where you have that first experience where there's the awareness of your emotions, there's the awareness of your body, there's the awareness of the thoughts in your mind and that's where you first start to, at least for me, where I first started to develop that kind of witness perspective where I can be sitting in a meditation and I'm aware of a lot of different things going on at once but I'm experiencing that stillness, so I'm sensing things while at the same time not moving, not talking, not fidgeting, really being mm -hmm. still and grounded. And then that meditation sort of, again, with the, the word application, that principle, I find that a lot of the time, well, I won't say a lot of time, my goal is to sort of be living in a meditation, even if I'm doing something that's very active or I'm very engaged in something. So I could be driving like a maniac, and if you saw me driving, whizzing through traffic, you'd be like, oh my God, that guy's out of control, he must be stressed out. But I'm just literally totally zoned in in the moment in a flow state, whipping in and out of traffic, you know, and I'm having this sensation of the momentum that the car is making and my hand on the steering wheel and how much play there is in the steering wheel and where my feet are on the pedals and how my body's situated within that car and time and space and the fact that I'm flying down the street at 54 miles an hour or whatever. So that wouldn't be possible without first learning how to create that space and that awareness while being totally still and not engaged in anything. So it's sort of like the practice of meditation spills out into other affairs which is really cool. And that can be something that's enjoyable, like having sex, eating chocolate, smelling a rose, those types of things, but also being able to have that same kind of sensual experience with pain and discomfort, mm. which has been the only way I've ever really been able to overcome emotional pain, trauma, loss, having attachments ripped out of my hands, you know, things like that, where you want to run and do something to distract yourself from the pain. but. I find the best painkiller is like actually walking right into the middle mm. of the storm, you know? It's like the opposite of spiritual bypass. Like, no, yeah. I'm not floating above like my human pain and my ego pain. I'm actually going, okay, cool, ego, you're freaking out right now because the instincts are threatened and you're going to get hurt or lose something or not get what you want and that sort of animal level of being and operating in the world. When that comes on and it becomes painful, my practice is to just fully sense it, be aware of it and go right into it. Like one of my favorite teachers, David Hawkins says, you know, when you, when you have an anger problem, it's not that you get angry too much, you don't get angry enough. Mm, you didn't get to that point. Yeah. You, you stopped to, yourself. You have to experience the anger. And anyone mm. that's done like experiential therapy knows that, you know, you hate your parents or your wife that divorced you or whatever it is, and you get a baseball bat and you hit some pillows and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's no big deal now. What happened? I was able to express mm. that emotion, which is also part of the senses. You know, it's like sensing, hmm, there's a disturbance here. I'm either going to run and avoid it and then have to deal with it later because I'm suppressing or repressing it and it's going to come out in some seemingly unrelated uh, relationship or area of my life or just walk through it and deal with it and be able to process it in a way that's healthy by sensing it and being able to, I call it like taking the arrows, you know? Mm. It's like I had a breakup a couple months ago and it was, I mean, it was so sad, it was so painful. I mean, I can just feel it now. It's a visceral like, oh God, why can't this work? It's just heartbreaking, you know? And I just, I wanted to run and find some way to quell the pain, just pound some ice cream or, you know, <laughs> I don't smoke sick. I don't have many vices anymore, but mm -hmm. what few I have, you know, it could be Instagram, just zoning out on social media, something to distract myself from the pain. And I kept mm. having to bring myself back into the pain and allowing those memories to come up and allowing that loss to just fully infiltrate my soul mm -hmm. in order to move through it. For now, I can look at it from a more reflective point of view and see the lessons and see the beauty in the experience even though it was painful at certain stages and that's all based in senses all of those things are minute senses that one can experience 
I relate so much to that. And especially after that time of mourning, instead of going back to an addiction, to really take time for yourself. And we talked about that the other day, too, on on your, you know, romancing yourself. So what are some things? Oh, that's that, funny. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing now? Can, can you share some of the, the tools? That, romancing yourself. That's, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Because you're in this, this unique time that you talked about. Yeah, I am. It's the first time in my I, I saw some repetitive patterns in my relationships. Mm-hmm. And like we talked about, that's like an area that I'm just going, hmm, I could really use some <laughs> development here. You R&D. Know, some, yeah, yeah, R&D. <laughs> I'm a more deep. I always forget, honestly, I forget how old I am. I'm going to be 47 in a month or a month and a half, you know? So it's like, I don't, you know, I'm not putting myself down, but I, I think in that area, I could use some more maturity. I, I've got a lot figured out, but this one's like, wow. So what I'm doing now is I committed to a period of celibacy and no dating and no flirting and stuff, as I was telling you the other day, which I've never done. So I started dating and having sex in 1986. I was born then. <laughs> really? Not. I was getting ready when you were born. Uh, 1986, I was 16 years old, you know, going to rock shows and just being a madman, doing drugs and, you know, banging every girl that would possibly have me. And, uh, and I really have never had a period where I wasn't dating or engaging with women, you know? And so I was either in a relationship or got out of one. And the way I would cope with the loss of getting out of one is go date a bunch of people and have sex a lot. And then you kind of forget about the one that you're heartbroken over, which is, mm-hmm. you know, I want to I don't say it's right or wrong. I don't want to put it in that duality, but maybe not the most mature or productive way to, to process a loss. So in this loss, as I said, I'm just like, I'm going right through this. I'm not going to ease the pain by jumping into something else. There's something in me that sort of has created these patterns and I want to really be able to see what they are. So what I've been doing is cultivating more self-love and self-respect. Because what I really, one of the things I really appreciated about the last relationship is this girl was just so into me and just saw me for who I was and just loved me unconditionally. And it was so powerful to be able to experience that, you know, and that was one of the hardest things to kind of lose, you know, of course, my appreciation of love of her, but it was like, oh my God, I've really shown this person who I am, warts and all, they know everything about me and they still love me, which was like shocking because I still have this inherent sense of shame, you know, way down below the surface. And I sort of was able to work through that. And then when the relationship ended, I thought, oh, I missed that feeling. I need Mm -hmm. to find someone else that sees me in that way and loves me in that way. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of had this revelation, really, not that some, not even intellectually, but there was almost a voice that said, Luke, she was just reflecting back what you already have inside, you know, Mm -hmm. not to diminish the love that was expressed from her to me, but what I'm looking for is not you to be able to show me that worth. I need to own that worth and value myself, you know? So, I mean, I do stuff now, just, you know, experiment with things. I put my hand in my heart and I just express Mm -hmm. love toward myself. I look in the mirror and I say, dude, you're all right. You're a good guy. You're doing okay. I love you. You know, I do affirmations that I read in the mirror just about the things that I want for myself in terms of my own personal integrity and the contribution I'm able to make to the world and really just spending time to build that self-worth and self-esteem. It's weird because I've been sober for a long, long time and part of, you know, addiction recovery is being of service. And it's always said kind of in the recovery community that if you have like shame or low self-worth or self-hatred and things like that, that how you build self-esteem is by doing esteemable acts. And so Mm. you just need to help enough people and then eventually you feel good about yourself. And it's like up to a certain point that works, but I've done a lot of that and there's still a part of me that feels unworthy. And I don't care how many drunks I take to a 12 step meeting or, you know, guys that pick up from rehab or, I mean, I've really helped a lot of people and I'm not, Like, it's not like a brag. I'm like, oh, I'm such a good guy. I've done it to save my own ass. It's just how the process of recovery works. Mm -hmm. You don't keep it unless you give it away. And I understand that and I love that. But even doing good deeds hasn't really given me a deep sense of self-worth where I really, really value myself. And so, Mm -hmm. again, bringing it back to sensing is like sensing where the level of shame is in me at any given moment. You know, I I wouldn't be able to look you in the eyes or, God forbid, be this intimate on camera. I don't even know where you're going to air this, who's going to see it. I mean, I'm being very vulnerable and real. I'm real. This is the real me, you know? I mean, this is 
as real as it gets is as if there's no cameras. And I wouldn't be able to do that unless I had a certain degree of self-acceptance of like, you know what? I got a lot of shit to work on, but I've also done a lot of work and I've come mm-hmm. a long way from where I came from even a year ago or even nine months ago when I got into the last relationship. I mean, I've grown years worth in this period of time because I've been willing to take the arrows and just mm-hmm. feel the pain and feel the growth and, and to open my self up to observing that shame and then finding that to do something within myself to cultivate that self-love and self-worth so that then I mean, it's not the goal but then i can foresee in the future at some point when i feel ready to explore that that i'll meet someone again that will be able to reflect the new degree of self-love and understanding and acceptance that i have mm-hmm. in other words i won't be looking out there for someone else to give that to me because inherently within that is where codependency and addictive relationships and love addiction and sex addiction and all that stuff where I'm looking for someone else to heal me. Or, to fill a void. Yeah, it's like you complete me, that thing. It's like the no. cry of the codependent, you know? And I just, yeah. I don't want to live like that. I really, I desire having an emotionally healthy relationship with myself that I can then invite other people, friends or otherwise, into and share in like an interdependency and i love i love what you said about so you're with someone that saw you and that you know had that unconditional love and affection for yourself and i think i was in a very similar place with having that feeling for maybe the first time and once you have that feeling instead of just running off to the next you know possibility of having that again it's that reminder yes, the light bulb is on. I need to find that within myself. I just wanted to reiterate that for everyone who's watching because that is one of the biggest things that you can take away from an amazing relationship is that knowing that, yes, you are so worthy and desirable and that, you know, the the nicest thing anyone can ever say to you is I see you. I think that's the most incredible compliment that one can give. I see you. And when we feel seen, we feel like we have the permission to, we breathe. It's like if someone's like, I see you, I'm like, oh my God. You know, we try so hard. We're always out there serving, giving, providing, and to just feel seen from just a moment. That's all we're craving. So thank you for bringing that point up. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. Three weeks ago, I wouldn't have even known what you're talking about. (laughs) You know, it's like, well, it's all of this stuff, all the personal development, personal growth is experiential. You know, I could read it in a book. I could even hear you talk about it. But until I've Mm -hmm. experienced it, it's just, oh, yeah, that rings true. You know, those kind of things where you're like... That makes sense. Write that quote down. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense, but it's not like, oh yeah, I get it. Yeah. And that's and I do get it that having the trust to be seen and know that the universe in the form of that other person facing you mm. will still accept you. And also the faith in God or in the universal intelligence or whatever you want to call it, that even if you allow yourself to be seen and that person rejects you for who you are, that it's like inherent to that fact that they're not the person you're supposed to be with at that given time Mm -hmm. which gives you more freedom to romance yourself yeah yeah you know (laughs) what i mean so yeah that's the experience i'm having now is like you know what i'm giving less fucks every day like i'm Mm. just like you know what the world at large podcast sphere video sphere youtube whatever you know it's like i just want to be me Mm. it's so much work to put on a front and to protect oneself from vulnerability. You know, it's just, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's literally exhausting. It's exhausting. The <laughs> hypervigilance of looking right and sounding right and, and really all of the effort it takes to hide oneself mm-hmm. to protect your heart. It's so much energy is required to do that. It's like, so, okay, cool. I'm just open and I'll know on a, deep level when it's safe to go even further with individuals you know but just in general it's just like cool here i am this is me universe and some people are going to dig it and some aren't and i'm willing to let the people go that you know i'm not for you know what Mm. i mean it's like cool there's plenty of people you only need a few friends you know a few really good friends and then yourself i have about (laughs) five really close friends i'm like you know what that's actually plenty I'm good. I don't have yeah. time for, you know, to be really close and be there on a, on a deep level for that many people. And I really only need three, four or five people there for me when I'm really, really down and out that I can call and be like, dude, I'm dying here. Help me, man. You know, or just come be with me. And I've, I've been so 
lonely and depressed at times, I'll call a homie and just be like, dude, can you just come to my house and just sit around with me for a while? <laughs> I can't be by myself. I'm in too much pain, you know? Mm. I just, I need connection. So you don't need 500,000 Instagram followers to like you. You need about five friends that'll be there for your ass when, <laughs> when, you know, when the chips are down. Stand by for a brief yet crucial announcement. Since I launched this podcast over a year and a half ago, I've received literally hundreds of inquiries from listeners asking me for my top recommendations in terms of health supplements and biohacking technologies. Now, I'm someone who's been borderline obsessive about health for the past 21 plus years. It's kind of just my thing. It's what I'm good at and it's what I really enjoy. And I really love passing my findings and research on to my friends and listeners. What many of you don't know, however, based on the number of emails that I still get asking the same questions, is that I now have a store on my website where I've curated all of the best stuff that I've found in all of these years of research and development. So if you want my recommendations, it's really easy. You can find them all in one place. Go to lukestory.com forward slash store. And there you will find every single product and service that I have personally found and vetted and feel confident in recommending to you, the listener. So again, go to lukestory.com forward slash store and you'll find all of my top recommended products there. It's important to note, however, that I do not personally sell anything. However, on my store, you'll find a description and a link, and in many cases, even a discount for all of the products and services that I endorse on my web store. So go to lukestory.com forward slash store to find everything you'll need to support a healthy lifestyle. So I want to know, what do you do to take your time off Instagram? Because you are such an amazing Insta celebrity. Your, your stories are incredible. You're documenting everything from the infrared sauna to putting your feet in the grass. <laughs> everything, right? So I did a funny one in, in a cryotherapy <laughs> chamber today. I had my friend like stand oh next gosh. to the glass and like get super close. <laughs> it's funny because you can see the frost on my eyelashes and stuff. Oh and, yeah, it's hilarious. So I want you to tell me about the rituals that aren't on camera. What do you do? to really romance and to, to give yourself that, you know, whether it's self-reiki or whether it's affirmations, but what don't you, sh is, there, is there something, is there a tool that people can use when they're really disconnecting to really tap into that essence of, of their soul and that, that relationship with themselves? You know, it's funny, I think just because I'm in the business I'm in now, the, I guess, the content that I put out into online and social media, the content are the things that I find or have found in my life that, that do that for me. And so mm -hmm. it's funny, like my public persona and the stuff I'm putting out and my stories, mm -hmm. like today I was pretty fatigued because I didn't sleep well last night. Mm -hmm. I, I'm getting over a cough and I woke up at four in the morning like hacking. I saw that at four, yeah. <laughs> like... yeah just so, it's just such a pain in my ass. I'm like, God, <laughs> I, I'm, I feel good physically a lot of the time. So if I don't, I'm a huge baby. But I went to Kundalini Yoga this morning. Then for me, I went to cryotherapy because I want mm. the neurotransmitter boost. I want the inflammation relief. Uh, it gives me a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, it wakes your ass up when you get in three and a half minutes at 160 below. So it's like, that's something I would just go do anyway as a self-care ritual. But while I'm there, sometimes I'm like, ah, this would make a funny Instagram story too. <laughs> and, and it would also turn people on to something that could do the same thing for them. So I look at myself as kind of, um, you know, as it said in, in, in my bio that I sent you, I'm like a guinea pig. You are, and I just, yeah. I like to try things out and see what has validity and what doesn't, whether it's mm -hmm. a spiritual practice or a health or biohacking thing. And it's sort of hard for me to just keep it to myself and make it my own little thing. So the things that I do that people don't see are just thoughts and feelings that I'm cultivating within myself that I maybe don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Like you asked me, what did I learn in, in the workshop I was in? And that's what I was doing in the beginning mm -hmm. of this interview. If you wouldn't have asked that, you would have, would have never known. I would have never mentioned that I'm sitting here being very aware of my body and my posture and my breathing. And I'm holding space for you. And I'm, I'm telepathically telling you, you've got this. And I'm even praying a little bit like, God, you know, be with us right here and just help us to do whatever we're supposed to be doing and, and getting my will and my little ego's ideas out of the way and just 
doing whatever's going to serve the highest good in any given situation. So the unseen is more from the place of uh, intention, mm. more so than like doing something. It's more of an allowing, it's more of a yin than a yang, you know, it's like, hmm, I'm just sitting back and I might even be very active or engaged with someone, but there's still a part of me that's tethered to the unseen hand, you know, it's like, okay, I'm still connected to this thing, which is another inherent quality to masculine energy where you can be active and engaged and producing, but at the same time, there's a meditative quality to what you're doing. And you're also having a place inside of stillness while you're being proactive and type A and alpha and out crushing it. And that's, that's a really, again, an inside thing, an inside job, you know, it's something that I'm cultivating. But today, since you asked, I had a beautiful experience in Kundalini Yoga. You know, we did a, a meditation, it was 22 minutes, and I forget the mantra offhand, but you, one thing, you had your hand on your heart, and then you had your hand in some goofy, you know, mudra, and, and I started to feel the beauty in the song. And I went into a very feminine energy space and I allowed myself to just, I just started crying. I was just sitting there weeping and it wasn't about anything. Mm -hmm. There were some thoughts associated with the feelings. Oh, a loss, a missing someone, you know, this, that. But it was just, it was just allowing myself to have a moment of humanity. And everyone's eyes are closed. No one knows I'm doing it. That shit's not on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling a lot. Gratitude. You know, like, God, my life is so special. It's so fantastic the things i get to experience and that was like the first tears i had i think were just like wow this is a beautiful mantra like mm -hmm. how cool is it that i'm here with a hundred people that all want to grow spiritually and there's the space for me to go do that and a, and a great teacher and some music facilitating that process and then i thought about there were some sad thoughts you know just about things that i needed to grieve and so the gift to myself today was just allowing myself to feel some feelings and not be embarrassed if when that mantra ends and then everyone opens their eyes they can see that i've been crying because my eyes are red or my eyelashes are wet you know i turned to the guy next to me i was like man i just cried my eyes out i'm like you you know he's some big ripped guy in a baseball cap you know I, it's who knows what experience he was having but when it was done she's like okay now talk to someone and i was like there's like super hot girl like two people away i'm like i'm definitely not talking to her i'm not that humble i don't want her to see like what a mess i am you know but i was like i'll talk to the homie you know and i just i shared the experience with him and it was well received mm. but the inside part was just my own experience of allowing myself to just go okay there's a moment to be had here and it really set the tone for my day because i've had very heartfelt connections with every person that i've interacted with since then from the girls behind the desk at cryo to you to my business partner and our employees that i met with today at school of style and i've been very heart-centered because i set the tone with that this morning mm. without saying anything to anyone about it or posting about it you know i post the results of that inner work it's like wow i'm a really happy guy out there mm. playing in the grass before we start the interview <laughs> or whatever but it all is made possible by my willingness to be in my heart and experience whatever it is in the moment, whether it's pretty or cool or not. Mm. Yeah, sharing your emotions. You ask really good questions because I <laughs> notice I'm like, I'm going on for like 20 minutes each question. They must be really <laughs> meaningful, deep questions because I have, I have a lot of passion and enthusiasm about the answer. So thank, thank you for you. <laughs> thank you for allowing me to sort of, um, you know, expand on some of these ideas. It's things that I, this is what I love to talk about. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, I do my podcast and I talk about superfoods and herbs and biohacking and that's cool. But it's almost like after a few years of doing that stuff, it's a little bit superficial. There's like there's deeper work mm -hmm. to do on the inside. It's, it's good to be physically healthy. Like I, I'm into it. But no matter what food you eat, you got to be able to find that. Mm, your higher self, a relationship to your higher self. Yeah. That and, and practice starts. living from that place. Mm -hmm. Not as an idea, not as a concept, but as an actual, an operational way of interacting with the world. And that's why I created this. It's so you can have that irrevocable partnership with your soul and to really understand what you need at any given moment and tap into your senses to find your own self-soothing, your own nourishment, your own um, inner romance. And so... I like that, inner romance. That's inner good. romance. It's like, how do you find that within yourself? Because so often our society teaches us that we need to go outward for that. But as you experience today with Kundalini Yoga, you can just 
you can get that from a feeling that you created that. No one else did that for you. Yeah, there was a mantra and yeah, there was beautiful vibrations around you in class, but it was your own willingness to be vulnerable and to feel the mantra, to feel the sound, to feel the energy from the meditation. That's you and that's that's the real you. So I'm so happy that you shared that and that many people today have all been experiencing the aftermath of that awakening inside of you. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, that's how we all they discover these practices and these ways of doing things. I mean, this is I don't even for me to even know to do that. It's from listening to my teacher Tage in class and how she said, "Hey, now we're going to open your heart or we're going to uh, clean your aura or whatever or I listen to a Ram Das lecture or Alan Watts or mm. read an Eckhart Tolle book or whatever it is it's like all of these messengers have been you know activated by spirit and um, we all resonate with different ones at different times but again it comes down to application when I hear a spiritual teacher talk about an experience they've had I try to emulate what they're doing it's like when I was a kid and I'm sitting there learning black sabbath songs on my guitar like i i'm not just listening to the music i want to play the music mm -hmm. you know and i want to play the music of evolution and of uh of of growth you know and that requires me doing something but i can't just invent it it's not all sort of intuitively inspired i hear someone else do something and i go okay i'm going to try that and see if i get the same result which most of the time i do yeah, you do some pretty awesome things. So I know people want to know how they can find you and learn about the places you're going to and the teachers that you've been working with. So how do we stay connected to you? Where do we find you? Well, I, I think like my crown jewel of, of content and what I'm, I don't want to use the word proud, but what I'm most grateful for and passionate about at the moment is my podcast, which is called The Lifestylist. And it's sort of a play on my former career as a fashion mm. stylist. Uh, now I look at it as bringing experts together from all these different fields in health, wellness, spirituality, um, extracting from them their wisdom, sharing that with the audience, and at the same time, adding to my arsenal of tools. And so the Lifestylist podcast is a way to get to know me and the experts that I'm able to curate. And then I also have, of course, a website like, like many of us do, lukestory.com. And on there, I have a number of different videos uh, that I've produced of podcasts and just various other things. Uh, and um, and then also on on Instagram, you know, is is where I kind of live my day to day life and show people, hey, this is this cool place where I go get these supplements, or this is the way I um, the the stuff that I do on an airplane to prevent jet lag. Like I share a lot of tips that I've discovered and put together over the years uh, there on Instagram as well. And then what I'm most excited about, I think, right now is working one on one with people doing coaching. I never liked the term like health coach or life coach, like every term for coach. I don't even like the word coach because I don't really like sports. You know, when I was a kid, I hated PE and sports. I was Me like, I don't want to coach. Pick class so I don't know class. what to call it other than coaching. But what I really enjoy is like working with someone one on one for I, I've now got a 90 day program and three months to me is like you can move the needle. You know, you can really make something happen. So that's what I'm kind of digging last night. I just enrolled uh, a new I don't even want to call it a student. I got to learn the terminology for these things because we're like partners in, in a joint venture yeah. of their own development. But at the same time, it really feeds me. So it's, um, it's, it's a great way to make a living, but it's also something that I've been doing for free for 20 years. You know, mm. it's just that now there's too many people to do it for free because I have a platform. And so now I'm like, okay, well, you can only do it with so many people per week or per month. So now it costs people money, you know? Yeah. But it's uh, it's a really neat exchange that I'm really enjoying, and so that's my what I call it is lifestyle design. You know, it's taking all of these different practices and elements and making kind of a custom program for someone based on their emotional type, their intellectual type, the things that they're going through, where they are at this stage in development. Someone might like not want to work on any deep emotional or spiritual stuff right now. They just want to like learn how to be paleo or vegan or whatever okay cool we'll start there on the surface mm. get your biology dialed in 
Then we'll start then, yeah. doing some of the inner work. It sneaks in. That spiritual work just totally. sneaks right in. Or sometimes it's like <laughs> even a client won't know. They're like, dude, I've lost my connection to who I really am. Let's work on that. And then all of a sudden they don't want to drink anymore and they quit smoking cigarettes and they stop eating corn syrup and aspartame and MSG and all the crap they're eating from you know the regular grocery store because they start loving themselves. So it goes both ways. It's weird. It, I've, I've yet to figure out the proper formula and I think that's because every person's a snowflake and the formula is mm. different for every single person. They're all going to like get to the top of the mountain on a different trail so to speak you know or someone will resonate with a certain spiritual book while someone else doesn't. I mean I've taken Jewish clients and I start them on Emmett Fox Sermon on the Mount which is a Christian <laughs> a Christian teaching essentially and they're like I'm all in you know if they have an open mm. mind and maybe I might turn someone else on to K Kabbalah that is you know was raised as a Catholic or something so it's just you never know like what's going to resonate with someone you kind of just try until uh, you get a genetic match you know to someone's spirit and then you kind of go down that road and take it as far as you can go. It's pretty remarkable, all that you're doing. That's fun. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank I have you. two gifts for you. Oh my God, I was going to, I saw that sitting there and I was like, it smells really good in here. I don't know if it's you or there's some sort of like diffuser or candle, but is that what smells? This is what smells. Is that what you're This wearing? one's Grace. Yes, it's a blend of Ooh. rose geranium, patchouli, sandalwood, and rose hip. And oh, patchouli and sandalwood are like two of my favorite. Love. Those are like the manly oils. The manly oils. That's awesome because it has a very neutral smell too. It's not like I wasn't like, oh, who's wearing perfume? I just was like, hmm, it smells mm -hmm. good in here. That's awesome. It smells like love, aphrodisiac. So it's one of my favorite romance yourself. This is techniques. amazing. Thank you. I like the sacred geometry on here. Thank too. you very much. Like it's very vibey. So I get this. You get that. It's a gift from me, Showing from my heart. Thank yes. <laughs> it's called a jai, and awesome. I make it here in Venice. And thank then the you. other is a selenite wand from our sponsors of this episode, Energy Muse. Oh, cool. Have you heard of them? Yeah, I have heard of Energy Muse. Yeah, yeah. So they have an amazing store or just a um, uh, warehouse in Torrance, in Torrance, California. I have heard that. I want to go there. Oh my God, they have a, an energy pyramid that you can go in. So if you ever need grounding or protection or more love in your life, they have crystals for everything. And selenite is really good for clearing your space. You can just get negative energies off you or have it in your in your pocket all the time just for emotional protection and strength. So Cool. Thank you so much. Yes. I didn't know I was getting gifts. Wow, this is <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> These are so cool. They have a really neat touch feel too. Speaking of senses. Yeah. There's like nothing quite in nature that has that exact feel. I know. Can you believe that just came out of, well, it didn't come out of the ground, but it's deep, deep within the ground. It's so. crazy. Yeah. That's cool. Cool. I'm going to like make it a fashion. <laughs> it's too. a new pocket square. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you for being yeah. here today. Yeah, of course. And we'll follow your journey and see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, there it is. I got it over with. I, uh, I finally put out this damn interview with Fern. So if you made it to the end of the show and you're hearing me right now, thank you so much for joining me on the journey. As I said in the intro, it's been about 13 months now that I've really been focusing on this area of my life and... You know, my hope is that in having conversations such as this one, that more of us can really start to be open about the things that we struggle with. And I know relationships in my life have been challenging, to say the least, or uh, or something that I've just uh, avoided in many ways uh, because they were challenging and I didn't want to have to deal with it. So it's been an amazing year for me and uh, quite a bit of time, as I said, has passed since I did this interview, but I just felt in my heart, I just needed to put this out, that there's someone out there that would benefit from uh, what I had to share. And Fern's just such, such a great interviewer and the topic and the way that she presented it was just very interesting to me. And I just really enjoyed the conversation. It stuck out in my mind enough where I thought, you know what, someday I'm gonna put this out. And so there it is. And um, what else is going on? Oh, don't forget to tune in Tuesday when we get back to our normal programming, meaning where I actually interview someone else. I'll be talking to Chris Keen, who's uh, one of the guys that runs something called 40 Years of Zen, which I did with um, Dave Asprey's crew at Bulletproof a couple years ago. And this is one of the most powerful biohacks I've ever experienced. And I even continue to do uh, work much like that at Peak Brain LA in uh, West LA. And it's called Neurofeedback. And it's 
too difficult and scientific and wacky to explain right here, but this is one of the most powerful interventions for stress, anxiety, ADHD, ADD, PTSD, all of the acronyms. You ever wonder what, well, I guess I know what PTSD stands for, but what does ADHD stand for? Maybe I can't focus long enough to figure it out. Uh, what? Not to make light of a condition that, you know, I'm sure is very difficult for a lot of people. But I make light of everything on this show. Because listen, man, all of our struggles at the end of the day are, uh, you know, just a game that we have to get through in the human experience. But I really think that this interview with Chris Keen is going to benefit a lot of people that have um, perhaps sought other medical pharmaceutical interventions to some of the problems that we all have. I know I've had a lot of trouble with many of those issues in my life and um, neurofeedback has helped me a lot. So that episode will be dropping on Tuesday per our usual schedule. Now, here's what I'd like you to do, guys. I'd love for you. No, I wouldn't like you. I would love. We're talking about love in this episode. So I would love for you to subscribe to the show. How do you do that? You open whatever podcast app you're listening to my voice on right now. Well, it's already open. I mean, pick your phone up and look at it right now. All right, I'm waiting. Three, two, one. You got it in your hand? Find somewhere on that screen to click subscribe. Ding, hit subscribe. That way, every week when I put out a new show, it will get magically uploaded to your device or your computer, whatever you're listening to this on. Okay, so that would be great. I don't want you to miss any of the shows. And it's good for me just to get my show out there to as many people as possible. Speaking of which, are you a super fan? Are you one of those fantastically beautiful people who messages me on Instagram or Facebook or uh, rates into my website and thanks me for the show? You know, I really appreciate hearing from you guys um, and, and don't stop doing that. But what I would appreciate equally, if not more, is if you could share this episode with a friend and help spread the word about the Lifestylist podcast. And if you want to get hardcore, if you're like super, super, super fan, even if you're new to the crew here and you want to like go deep with the service and the give back, uh, then you could... Click on the podcast app again and find where it says rate and review and leave a rating and a review. This is a really powerful way to support a podcast. I'm sure you figured out if you listen to a lot of shows that every host is like, don't forget to leave us a rating and review in iTunes. Well, there's a reason why, because if people don't leave you ratings and reviews, your show basically disappears into the ethers of iTunes. And when that happens, it is not good, my friend. It's like being the uncool kid in school. And I've already experienced that a lot in my life. And <laughs> I'm tired of being the kid in the corner with the dunce cap. I want a popular damn podcast, damn it. No, I'm kind of kidding. But seriously, uh, three things to do. Subscribe to the show. Share the show with a friend right now. The apps make it so easy now. Just click on there. See where it says show. Just text the link to this show or any of the episodes that have moved you to a couple friends and uh, if you want to go the extra mile and spend oh 60 seconds to uh, two minutes perhaps click rate or review on your app and uh, tell me what you think of the show it's a great way to show your support so thank you so much for listening and i will catch you next tuesday with another episode of the lifestylist podcast i'm your host luke story checking out don't forget to let those fingers do the typing to get yourself over to Organifi.com with an I where you can enter the code Lifestylist and save 20% off on all of their fantastic products, not the least of which being the new Organifi Gold, which is my favorite warm golden latte evening drink. I mix it up with a little butter or ghee and it is absolutely fantastic. You got to try it out. It's very relaxing calming, detoxing, superfoods, herbs. It is amazing. Okay, check it out at Organifi.com. Use the code Lifestylist and save 20%. I'd like to, again, thank our sponsor, Athletic Greens. And I want to remind you to get over to athleticgreens.com forward slash Luke to hook up with your 20 free travel packs valued at $99. That's right. Get over to athleticgreens.com forward slash Luke. Show yourself, them, and the show some love. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast was produced by podcastmasters.net.